Has your chronic illness made it difficult to continue working in the traditional way? Want to learn how to find and create flexible remote work that both accommodates your chronic illness and generates an income? Join the Patients Getting Paid membership, a community of chronicpreneurs where people just like you find workshops and trainings, weekly updated condition-specific gigs, twice-monthly coaching calls, co-workings, accountability, and the kindest community to support you on your path to make money while working from anywhere and taking good care of yourself. Learn more or join us at patientsgettingpaid.com. Hey, I'm Brianna Seely, producer for The Heart of Healthcare. Before we get started today, I'd like to tell you about another show in the Offscript Health Podcast Network. Is it serious? Is It Serious is a podcast hosted by Dr. Jean-Luc Neptune and Dr. Mark Lewis. These physicians are pulling back the curtain on American healthcare, addressing all of your health concerns, one question at a time. They share their medical knowledge in a really fun way, while also answering the question of the day. They've covered everything from medical TV show myths to how to become your own healthcare advocate. To find out more, visit offscript.com slash shows. The link will be in our show notes as well. Enjoy the show. Hello, listeners, and welcome to The Heart of Healthcare. I'm really excited to share that we are giving away $25,000 and we need your help. Do you know a healthcare organization that's really moving the needle in public health? Maybe they're helping prevent teen pregnancies or doing research in environmental health. Let them know about the Heart of Healthcare Grant Challenge. We are taking applications until September 10th on our website, heartofhealthcarepodcast.com. Dr. Jennifer Lincoln is a board-certified OBGYN who is passionate about helping girls, women, and those assigned female at birth understand their bodies and feel empowered to advocate for themselves. She is the author of Let's Talk About Down There, and OBGYN answers all your burning questions without making you feel embarrassed for asking. With a community of 2.8 million TikTok followers, Dr. Lincoln uses social media to educate and bust the many myths surrounding vaginal and reproductive health. She recently launched Three for Freedom, a campaign which highlights three things people can do now if they don't want to become pregnant in the near future and have concerns about abortion access. Dr. Lincoln, thank you for being here. Thanks so much for having me. It has been a long few months with the overturning of Roe v. Wade. I wanted to start by just asking, how are you? Where's your head at? Oh, you're so nice. Um, Honestly, so I took the last week off of social media and just having family in town and and going RV camping where I was disconnected. And that was really wonderful because up until that point, just feeling overloaded, feeling like there's so much to be done. And I just feel like every free second that I have there's something else that I need to tend to or some educational thing I need to do. Um, and it's a lot. It's it's hard because it's a marathon and it's just really hard to feel like there's time off to just let your brain quiet down, which is what we need to do. We have to yeah. fight, but we also have to rest in order to be able to keep showing up. So, so yeah. So thanks yeah. for this game. Yeah. How do you think about the long-term advocacy that you want to do and to ensure that you're not going to burn out? Because (laughs) you have a full-time job as well as another full-time unpaid job, which is being a women's health advocate. Yeah, it's it's a bit crazy. And I will say if, you know, somebody's listening and thinking, oh my goodness, how does she do it all? It is, I do work as a, you know, a regular doctor. I say it's my day job, but it's also my night job being an OBGYN. But I am part-time because I think if I did a true full-time job, there would be no time for anything other than that. So that helps. But everybody in medicine also knows that being part-time in medicine is is really like being full-time in other yeah. careers. So there's that. Yeah, I mean, I have a really solid support system. I'm working together with other people. Um, I'm in the process of forming a 501c3. 
running a website, doing all these other things. And it's, it's hard because I feel like as somebody who I thrive on lists and getting things done, it's, there's so much happening simultaneously that it's tricky. And so I just have to realize that it doesn't have to be perfect. We just have to show up and make a little bit of progress every day. And then when yeah. I feel like I'm failing, I turn to my friends and I'm like, no, no, you're doing great. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think for, for everyone, especially women, the last two and a half years with the pandemic, with the childcare crisis, with our reproductive rights being rolled back. There have been so many stressors that we're living with on top of anything else that we were dealing with. Yeah, it sucks. I mean, I don't know if yeah. I'm allowed to curse on this podcast, but it we are. sucks. Yes. <laughs> it, it's all a bunch of horse shit. Um, because yeah. yeah, I mean, you go from a pandemic, like you said, and for those of us who are parents, you know, doing the school thing and at home trying to be a teacher, which thank you teachers for everything you do, yes. because I will never be able to replace you. Yep. And then never having time off, just working more in the pandemic, working more with less, getting our pay cut during a pandemic, like super mm. fun things. And then just all of this. And we knew this was coming with Roe. We, the writing yeah. was on the wall, but still when it happened, you just, you just sort of hold on to that hope, like maybe it won't. And then it did. And just feeling like this is just one more thing. You just feel like the, it's just, things just keep happening and you're trying to plug the holes in a sinking ship. But knowing that if we all just work together, we can get there because that's what the majority of people want. The majority of people don't want, didn't want our reproductive rights rolled back. So we all have to show up and, um, continue to keep the ship afloat because our, you know, our our country kind of depends on the fact that we are able to be in control of our bodies. Yep. Yep. So what do you think is going to happen next? I think this will be a decades long fight. I mean, I'll be honest with you, this isn't going to change tomorrow or with another election or, you know, it's going to be maybe 20 to 30 years before we get back to where we were, which we will, because people do not want this and the fallout will be bad. People will die. People will realize that this thing, which maybe people who are against abortion are really happy that it happened, but it's so much more than abortion. It's birth control, emergency contraception, it's gay marriage, it's trans rights, it's immigration rights. It's just the chipping away of autonomy and the forcible government control. It's all about control. It's not about abortion. Mm -hmm. And so what will happen is we'll have to do what the right did back when, you know, literally the day that Roe passed as they started filling the lower courts and make sure that We have people in these local positions, which is way more important, not to say that federal level positions aren't important, but we need to make sure that we fight back on a local level, on a state level. And this will just be decades of lawsuits and people realizing just how bad it is, um, which is unfortunate to say. It doesn't mean that we can't, we should just give up. Literally what we're doing today and every day is what's going to change and get us back to where we need to be. But it's not going to, it's not going to change overnight. Yeah. Well, I have a lot of pieces I want to pull out of there. You know, you mentioned gay marriage and trans rights. Can Uh we start from there and how you think that could be impacted? Yeah. So we saw that when the decision was announced that Justice Thomas said that we should start to revisit all sorts of other things. And so when it comes to same-sex marriage, when it comes to trans rights, when it comes to, you know, things like don't say gay and criminalizing doctors or parents who, are taking their children to get the gender affirming care that they need, it's all coming. And it's because it goes against the narrative of what a certain regressive, an extreme part of the regressive Republican party wants, which is Mm. um, control of women. Control. Exactly. And I, and I do want to make it clear for people who are listening that, you know, when I say Republicans or I say regressives, because to me, that's what they are. um, It's not all Republicans by any means. It's this small extreme group of people who are, have now, co-opted this issue to get people to the ballot box. And for those who don't understand, this is something that happened once civil rights happened, um, you know, and segregation was outlawed in in the civil rights movement. It's when the Republicans realized they couldn't use that as a way to to galvanize people to to vote for them. They then switched over to, to this narrative. So the idea that they use abortion to get people to the polls, and now they're using abortion and like we said, gay marriage, trans rights, because it erodes at the, I mean, let's call it what it is, the white supremacist control of society, which is what they want. And I know it sounds really, (laughs) sounds really um, extreme, but that's what it is. Then the vast majority of Americans don't want this level of extreme, of extremism, you know, government control in their life. Yeah. So states, something I've been 
pointing out is that there are states that define life at fertilization. So the personhood concept Mm -hmm. at fertilization or conception, and they are banning abortion, but they're not banning IVF. And I think that is really what proves that this is about controlling women's bodies because Mm -hmm. a five-day embryo, whether it's in the womb or in a Petri dish, is the same thing. Why would it be considered abortion in one situation versus the other, other than the fact that we're trying to punish women for sexual activity. We're trying to control what she can do with her body. It's just, to me, look, I, I've, I'm I've fighting for saving IVF. I don't want IVF to be outlawed. I'm a mother only because of IVF. Mm-hmm. But I, I do worry that we're turning IVF into this carve out. And because IVF is pro-baby, I guess, <laughs> scientifically speaking, if you're not allowed to abort a one day fertilized egg, why would you be able to discard a one day fertilized egg in the lab during IVF? Yeah. Well, I actually think they will come for that. I think that they will Mm. start with their personhood laws. I think they will come for that. And I've already got my friends who are fertility specialists who are concerned, who are talking about how they would have to move their labs to other states and that it will, you know, as you know, you've gone through the process that it will force people to go through more cycles in order to get embryos if you're only allowed to retrieve what you're going to use? Or do you have to pay for all of them to continue to keep them as opposed to discarding them? So I do think that they will come for that. But I think it's you're exactly right. And and I do want to say to people who are listening that this isn't about, you know, defining when does life begin or what, you know, what is your belief? Because I'm a huge believer in that you believe what you believe. Like I'm not here to tell you that you should only think that it matters at viability or whatever, you know, because the point is, is that our personal beliefs are irrelevant to everybody else except for you. So to make legislation and make laws, especially these personhood laws with this idea that somehow, you know, it's okay, less than 12 weeks or less than eight weeks or whatever, yep. it's medically irrelevant. And when you take your personal beliefs and you make laws out of them, you're forcing your beliefs on other people, which... yeah. I just, and this is what happens, especially when you see, you know, Marjorie Taylor Greene and other people saying that we should become a Christian nationalist society. It's so anti-Semitic, all of these, the Mm -hmm. way that they're acting, these laws. I mean, we know in the Jewish religion that abortion is not promoted, but it's important because they believe in their faith that life, you know, a person who doesn't begin until actually taking their first breath at birth. So yeah. Mothers need to do that. So it's yeah. just focusing, it's, it's putting religion and personal beliefs into a government that theoretically is supposed to be separate from church and state. And it's harming people across the board. And I do think that IVF treatments will certainly be something that, that they do come for. Yeah. Do you think, so I've been seeing policies around Texas and I believe now in South Carolina, there's a bill where it's a crime to help someone get an abortion. And helping can be defined as having a website that provides information on where to go. I'm curious if you think that how far this will go in policing women and their bodies, for instance, will people have to take a pregnancy test before boarding a plane from a red state to a blue state? Like, how, yeah, yeah. What, like what does this future Handmaid's right, Tale look right. like? Right, because you go, where does it stop? Because yeah. people, you know, I remember, I don't know, maybe it was six or eight months ago, I made a TikTok where I said when Roe v. Wade is overturned, knowing that it would be coming, this was before the leak. And I had so many people there accusing me saying, you're overreacting. This will never happen. This will never happen. And I'm like, well, that didn't age well. I told you it, it happened. <laughs> so to say these things today, we might be like, oh, that's ridiculous. And then yeah. it <laughs> might very well be reality. So So yeah, so this whole idea of where does it stop? And this is why I say it will be decades before we get back to where we are, because what will happen is states like Texas, like Florida, other places, they will try to put somebody in jail, for example, for aiding and abetting what they, you know, having a website. I mean, I have a website, threeforfreedom.com, where I help people get birth control and emergency contraception and morning after pills. I'm in Oregon, but can I be in trouble because of a law in another state? Or what if I made that and I was in Texas? So I think what will happen is Mm. people, you know, there will be these arrests, there will be lawsuits, countersuits, all sorts of things. And it's very hard to differentiate what will happen at a state level versus a federal level, what law trumps what, and it's a whole huge mess, which is 
exactly what these regressives want because yeah. it is mass confusion, mass pandemonium. And that's why these elections matter. I mean, the 2024 election will really matter because then will they put on the table something like a national ban or other things that could be even more concerning at a federal level. Yeah. Um, what would you say are the chances of a national ban? What would you give it? I mean, honestly, I, I will, let me preface this with, uh, you know, people, I am not a politician or like, a, you know, any sort of political scientist. So I don't know the ins and outs of, you know, all these things, but I wouldn't put it past <laughs> yeah. a, you know, especially if somebody like Trump or one of his, his best friends wins the election that they, that they wouldn't try it. And this is why midterm yeah. elections are so important. Yeah. Um, but I, again, I will fully say I'm not a legal scholar, Yeah. Um, but will they try it? Of course they will. Of course. I mean, have we not seen what else they've tried? So, mm -hmm. yeah. So can you explain why abortion is healthcare? Yeah, it's, this is one I get very often in my social media where people say, how can you say it's healthcare? Because it's a medical procedure and it's healthcare, just like taking out your appendix is healthcare, just like a C-section is healthcare, just like IVF is healthcare. It's a medical procedure that can be life-saving, but at the very least, you know, people then try to qualify and say, well, it's only healthcare if. I only agree, agree with abortion, but anytime you put a qualification on something that you are putting these criteria on whether or not it counts, quote unquote, as healthcare. You're taking away a person's individual freedom to what they can do with their body. And when we take women and people who can get pregnant and say that they are no longer, they have no longer control over their reproductive freedom, we are making them less than human. So not only is it healthcare, but it's also a basic fundamental human right that we say that you cannot force somebody to do something with their body. So it's healthcare just in the way that donating blood is healthcare and donating a kidney is healthcare in that you can choose whether or not you want to do it and we can't force you to do it or to say that you you have to do this. Just like we should not force people to carry pregnancies, which for the vast majority of American women and people who can get pregnant, pregnancy is the most dangerous thing they'll ever do in their entire life. So yeah. So yeah, it's just, it's, you know, and of course we've all seen the extreme stories of what happens when somebody doesn't get an abortion or you know, the extreme scenarios, but at the end of the day, you don't need a reason to access basic health care, yeah. which is what it is. And it, and it has been, it's just only, you know, recently been politicized again to be an issue to get people to, you know, to vote, which is disgusting. What's going on with your colleagues in some of the states that now have the trigger law bans or new policies that are now abortions are completely illegal. So the red states where your colleagues mm -hmm. are, yeah. I'm curious, like, is it just that the lawyers are being brought in before? Like if there's a medical reason that someone needs to terminate? Yeah, they're struggling. I mean, they, they are, they're really struggling mentally to go to work, especially those who are specifically trained in family planning or, you know, or high risk pregnancies. And they're, they're giving these people these diagnoses of anencephaly, other things, you know, fetal anomalies that, will never result in a, you know, a living child, or they're seeing people um, who want to terminate for whatever reason, the fact that they, you know, they, this is not new. Let me back up. I mean, there's already been tons yeah. of ri ridiculous restrictive laws with waiting periods and mandatory counseling, ultrasounds, those sorts of things. So my colleagues have been used to this, but this is just next level. So to be forced to have to coordinate getting somebody out of state and doing it sooner rather than later so that the procedure is less risky and less costly to have to partner with these organizations that are you know helping with travel funds i mean it's just it is pure insanity and they are watching people be in a state of shock like what do you mean my baby doesn't have a brain and you're telling me that i can't terminate i have to be forced to give birth to a child who will later suffocate and die within minutes mm -hmm. of being born i mean it's disgusting yeah. so they're struggling and then when it comes to like what you know what is actually happening yeah it's calling up the lawyers at 2 a.m it's getting the emails from the department chair saying you can no longer offer this and if somebody comes in with their bag of water broken and they're preterm um, it has to go through this committee or that we are not allowed to to intervene and there's no test that you can order, like the how close to death test are you, or like what is considered extreme enough in order to move forward mm -hmm. with an abortion or, you know, or something like that. Because that's the thing is that it's not black or white. And very often pregnant people, we're young, we're healthy, our bodies compensate and we do great until we fall off the cliff and we become septic and die very quickly, as opposed mm -hmm. to older people who, you know, it can be more of a drawn out process. So, mm -hmm. you, know, our, you know, we tend to look really good until we crash, which always is on a weekend at 2am. <laughs> it's just yeah. how it works. And lawyers tend not to keep the same hours we do. 
Mm. And they don't understand the nuances and they don't want to either. They went into their field because of what they wanted to do. We went into our field to help people, not to have to have our hands tied by politicians who have no idea who, which mind you, when they need the abortion for their partner, their daughter, their mistress, their whoever, they will get it. They always have, and they always will. So they will never, they, they, they're fine. They sleep well at night. They're, they're just fine. It's the poor people. It's, it's the people who've always been marginalized, the people who can't access the care. It's really, it's really bad. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the thinking about how critical time is in cases of sepsis or any sort of infection, Mm -hmm. if you have to wait, you know, if it happens at Sunday afternoon and you have to wait Monday morning, that could be the difference of life and death for someone. Absolutely. Or if somebody yeah. comes in and bleeds, I mean, we know a huge amount of blood flow goes to the uterus every minute. I'm, mm. We've Every obstetrician has seen somebody who would have died had they not yeah. had an intervention. And it can go from a little bit of spotting to a hemorrhage very quickly. And, and when you don't know how you can intervene, and it's not just a physician either, because people say, well, the doctor should just do what, what they think is right. True. And it's a healthcare team. It's the nursing staff and the operating room staff. And can you imagine how scared every single one of these people is that they are told that they can be reported for aiding and abetting. And in some places it can be reported as a felony and they can lose their license and their kids will have no mother while they're in jail. Like there is so much more. So I I feel for these physicians. It's not just, well, do it anyway and ask forgiveness later. It's it's so much more than that. Do we risk them leaving the red states? And and, and these are likely states that have poor maternal health outcomes anyways. 100%. It's already happening. People are already leaving. Trainees, people who are applying to OBGYN residencies, they're saying, should I not go to these states? Because not only will I not get the training and abortion I need, but I'm also afraid I'll get in trouble. Or should I go because those people need help? You know, it's that moral quandary, which again, healthcare providers, physicians, we went into this. So I I hear that. Medical students saying, I don't want to go to these medical schools. So Yes. People are leaving, which is, like you said, it's in states already where they have these maternal care deserts where people may already have to drive 100 miles to to an obstetric care unit. And it's only going to get worse because there's going to be all these pregnant people and nobody's going to be around to deliver them or deal with it. So when I say, again, decades, what we're going to see is we're going to see worsening of preterm birth, maternal morbidity and mortality, which were already terrible when it comes to developed nations. And as we know, Black and brown women do the worst and they will continue to do the worst. So our our stats will get even worse, all in the name of saying it's about protecting life, right? When it's not. When it's not. We'll be right back after the break. Well, there are two pieces that we have to address as a country. There's reducing unplanned pregnancies and reducing unwanted pregnancies. So for unwanted, like if we don't have universal child care, if we have such high rates of poverty, of all these obstacles to becoming a parent, it is no surprise that people are not ready to become parents. They're not financially stable. They're not in a healthy relationship. They're, we know that being pregnant increases your chances of getting killed, Mm -hmm. Um, domestic violence. We have all these issues. So we have that piece, which really policy needs to play a role in. And then we have, you know, how do we actually prevent unplanned pregnancies? So things like birth control access, comprehensive Mm -hmm. sex education. What are some of the investments you think we need to make now more than ever? Oh, all of that. But what is my favorite mental exercise is go look at the states that are banning abortion and then go look at the states that do not fund comprehensive sex education, that only do abstinence only education, that don't, yeah. you know, fund childcare. And it's the exact same states. So don't these people who say, well, it's it's, you know, we'll we'll fund programs after these babies are born. You haven't and you won't. So stop lying. It's just yeah. not the way it is. So it's the exact mm-hmm. states where these things aren't there. And now more than ever, we need to make sure that people know how to get pregnant or how, you know, how they can get pregnant. So they know when not to have sex or how to access contraception. And I think this will be what they come for immediately next is emergency contraception, which some regressives say is an actual abortion. And of course it's not, or things like IUDs, which are one of the best ways to not get pregnant. But some people again, believe that they're abortifacients and they're not. So limiting a contraception right now, 
makes no sense. And when you saw the vote, it was a couple of weeks ago now, to to vote to protect contraception, and 135 Republicans <laughs> voted against it. And they're like, wait a minute. So you don't want abortion, but you don't want to make sure everybody continues to have access to contraception. Like, and then, you know, it's like, hello, people, hello, like the cards are on the table. Do you see? Yeah. They, they do not care. So yeah. all of that's important. So mistimed pregnancies, unplanned pregnancies, and keep in mind that 50%, about 50% of people who get an abortion were on birth control at the time that they got Really? 50, mm-hmm. 15 or 50? Five zeros. I think it's 51%. Wow. Actually. Yeah. On, on um, the pill? Or um, on... on just on a form of birth control. Even though they're, they're so effective. If, if, you know, if, if contraception is used perfectly, rates are really high, but I, yeah. you know, as OBGYNs, we tend to quote typical use. So it's typical yes. use of the pill, you know, 8% failure rate, or if somebody only has access to condoms. So my favorite yeah. comment I get in my comment section is, well, just keep your legs closed and don't get pregnant. <laughs> well, or use birth control. And then I throw that stat out and I'm like, well, they probably weren't doing a good enough job. So there's always like a, you know, mm-hmm. It's always chastising women, right? Because it's our job. Nobody is ever saying like, hey, guys, like make sure. Where's the male birth control? Right. Yeah. yeah. Which is coming, but it's going to be like five or 10 years before we even get that. So it's a whole hot mess. And what we have seen so commonly are people are against abortion until they themselves need one. And they say, I didn't, I thought I was doing all the things I was supposed to Mm. do. And and it happened to me. It's really easy to be a Monday morning quarterback. So we're seeing an increase in long-acting reversible contraceptions like IUDs, which is great, right? Mm Because they last five years, they're reversible, Mm -hmm. they're Mm -hmm. easy, but they're really painful for some people. Yeah, they can be. So about 17% of people who have an IUD placed will rate their pain as severe. Mm -hmm. Um, So the vast majority say it's no pain or it's mild to moderate. And that is something, you know, that if you look on social media, you'll, you tend to see a lot of fear mongering about IUDs, um, and mostly because people, when they have a bad reaction, of course, that's the person, you know, they're going to yeah. put their experience up. It's just like any sort of Yelp review. It's, it's like, really yeah, awesome. but it's exactly like a exactly. Yelp review. <laughs> but it's not to mitigate that, you know, people do not experience real pain. They absolutely do. There's lots of yeah. methods of pain control that we can use. But I do think a lot of the misinformation about IUDs results in people not wanting to use it or even from the medical establishment, ridiculous I've heard that doctors will still tell people, oh, you have to be on your period to get it, or you have to have a baby to get it, and all these things that are false and put up barriers. I had one comment sent to me from somebody um, after Roe fell. She said, yeah, I went to go to try to get plan B to have it in an IUD, and the nurse said, oh, honey, we can't do any of that anymore, which is false. (laughs) But people are being told this, which is, again, just disgusting. Well, tell us about your recently launched Three for Freedom campaign. Yeah, it's a website that I launched when the SCOTUS leak happened because we knew this would be coming. And there are phenomenal resources out there where you can get mail order birth control, where you can get emergency contraception mailed to you, and you can get medication abortion pills mailed to you. But there was no website where you could go and you could basically have a hub of all three of these things. So my hope was that while our freedoms are being taken away, there's three things that we can do right now, which is birth control, having morning after pills on hand and having even medication abortion pills on hand before you're pregnant. And I just wanted to make basically like a McDonald's drive through website where you could go through and you could say, okay, that website can ship to me and this one and that one, boom, I can go to them, order them and I'm done. And you can do it very quickly and easily. And I made it. And the day before Roe actually fell, so on June 23rd, we had maybe, I don't know, 200, 300 hits. And the day that Roe fell on the 24th, including the full 24 hours afterwards, we had about 83,000 hits to the site, which is amazing. And also very sad that people were that scared. And we're continuing to see where we'll take it and how we can make it work for people. But my goal is that people just know they can have one place to go to because there's so much information out there. It can be overwhelming. And um, I think the biggest thing that I want people to know is that you can still get medication abortion pills mailed in all 50 states. And somebody might say, what are you talking about, Jen? Like, it's illegal here in Texas or it's illegal wherever. And that's true from a U.S. pharmacy. But aid access is one option that I do have on the site where you can get these pills mailed to you from a pharmacy. It's legitimate, um, but it's mailed. The website is housed out in Europe and the pills come from a legitimate pharmacy in India. It's an actual prescription. So they can be mailed to you. Now, does that mean that eventually that might change or could that potentially put you at some legal risk? Absolutely. This is a workaround Mm. and there's lots of workarounds, but 
I think it's important to know because I get people in my DMs every day who are saying, how do I get pills? I don't know how. And to me, I think that this is common knowledge, but a lot of people don't know, or they think that there's an abortion ban in their state and there isn't one. So it's important to know what you still have rights to. Yeah, that's interesting. Yes, yeah, so I've heard about aid access and I knew that they were the only ones that were, I mean, I guess they're only protected because they're not here in the U.S. Mm-hmm. So we can't go after them. But it's interesting that other countries are now pitying us and like yeah. they're doing this development work to help us. Yeah, there's actually another organization called Women's First Digital, and they've got some amazing websites that are Mm -hmm. geared towards helping people get birth control, you know, all the things, medication, abortion pills in other countries like Africa and South America. Mm. And they reached out to me because they said our goal was to our donors always wanted to help the international community. But now they're so worried about the United States. They want to help the U.S. So we are falling so behind and going backwards And the rest of the world is saying, what, like people in Ireland are like, my goodness, this is where we used to be. Why would you ever go back to this? Most Americans are thinking the same thing. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Are you recommending that people stock up on emergency contraception? Yeah. And I, and I tell people, you know, because what we saw after Roe fell was the shelves empty, right? Of plan B Mm -hmm. and all those things. So I tell people don't like, don't hoard, don't pull a toilet paper, March, 2020 kind of thing, but definitely have, have, have one or two on hand because you might need it. A friend might need it. And time is of the essence. And I tell Mm -hmm. people, if you have a choice, pick Ella, which is prescription only. It's more effective at higher weights. It works longer. You have up to five days after unprotected sex, whereas the plan B and the generics are only three days, but it's prescription only. So if you can go through a mail order birth control company and have it on hand ahead of time, that way you've got it there for if, and when you do need it, you don't have that delay. Whereas other ones you can get over the counter of the plan B generics, but still I recommend have it on hand because you never know when you go to the pharmacy, the shelf might be empty. Yeah. I tried to go to Target a couple of weeks ago to get a plan B to use for a TikTok and it was totally gone. It was empty. Oh wow. So I had to order it and it was super expensive as a, compared to the generics. Yeah. But long story short, yes. And I also do recommend that you have medication abortion pills on hand because mm. you might need it, a friend might need it. And I don't know where the restrictions are going. And so I think it's important to to take control back. And maybe you never need it, but you don't know. Yeah. If you're someone though who lives in a state where it's banned. Would you have it shipped to a friend in a safe state to then ship it to you so that your state police can't track Mm -hmm. you down somehow? So that is one way to do it. And isn't this like disgusting that we have to like Mm -hmm. talk about this? Like, how do we get a pill that pills that are, of course, are FDA approved? And anyway, it's not like we're trying to ship cocaine here. Um, But yeah, so you can do that. You can have it shipped to a friend somewhere else and then they can send it to you. You can also do something called mail forwarding where you can get a mailbox somewhere else and then have an automatic forwarding address. And if you go to plancpills.com, they have some explanation of how to do this. And then the third option would be like using aid access, which knowing that it's coming from an international pharmacy. So if you're getting them in what we call advanced provision, so you're not pregnant, but you just want to have it on hand, they're so backed up. It could take a few weeks to get it. Mm, If you're pregnant, of course they are, they are prioritizing those, but it can still take a while. Yeah, And there have been some instances where they are um, detained at customs. And so it, not all of them are getting through. So I think in a perfect world, yes, you could have it sent to sent to a friend or a mailbox and then have it forwarded. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now I've, I've bought retinol, so prescription mm-hmm. online, and they asked for me to upload my driver's license. Mm-hmm. Is that something that you can work around if you're in a state or you're worried about having that information? Yeah, somehow. Yeah, no, I know. And to be honest, I don't know all the intricacies of that. I do know that the reputable websites that are doing this, I mean, they they are very much aware of the concerns with data storage. And so um, so I'm not totally sure about that. I do know when it comes to something like aid access or, or paying for these, One way around it is to use, you know, to use a secure browser, to use a VPN, to use like a prepaid Visa gift card. So you don't have to use your own credit card, which I just, this is all things (laughs) that are just putting up, right? Like, I I just, it's ridiculous. (laughs) Yeah, Handmaid's Tale. That's, yeah, that's just it. Mm -hmm. So tell me about your work as an advocate and an educator on social media and how, how you started because you're, you're TikTok famous. Yeah, it's (laughs) 
that's so that's so sad. I'm 40 and this is like what I'm known for. Um, <laughs> no, I mean my advocacy and my education. It started just in all things reproductive health, periods, birth control, myth busting, all that stuff. And and it definitely changes as I see what my audience needs. So when COVID first hit, it was changing a lot of my content to that, specifically to vaccination and pregnancy and, and concerns there. Obviously, right now I'm doing a lot of stuff about abortion and, and birth control and how to keep yourself safe. My favorite is when people drop into my comment section and they go, go back to the healthcare and not being political. And I'm mm. like, I, you know, first of all, wish I could, wish I could just talk about, you know, periods, fibroids and whatever, but, um, this is, this is healthcare and, <laughs> yeah. and unfortunately yeah. y'all made it political. So here we are. So, um, yeah. So it just sort of morphs into this, what, this what is my need. lane as Megan. Right. Lady right. Say. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Like, thank you. Yes. I will talk about this. Um, yeah. So I just try to I try to give people what they need, what they're asking me, myth busting, but also just putting out content so people can don't need me to myth bust. They can say, "Hey, I remember Dr. Jen's post saying that you know this is a red flag if you see this, so don't don't follow accounts like this because I think health literacy is super important as people try to navigate, you know, our healthcare in this society moving forward." So how do you deal with? all the trolls, all the haters <laughs> that are just like inevitable at that exposure level. Do you know, honestly, the trolls, like bless their heart. They make me giggle. They really do. Like I always tell them <laughs> be best and be blessed because have the day you deserve, you know? So when they drop into my comment section and they say these things, I'm always like, are you okay? Because you're increasing yeah. my engagement. You say you don't like my content. You've now commented yeah. on it. So now you're going to see it more. So that's, yeah. that's, a, that's a you issue. <laughs> I'm super proactive. I mean, I have a lot of words that never show up. So if somebody uses a certain word, I never even see the comment. Um, mm. It goes into like comment jail. I'm super proactive because I, yeah. I try to protect my headspace. There are just some words that if they're using those words, never are we going to have a productive conversation. Yeah. And I also think, you know, a lot of them I just delete, block, ignore because there's just nothing useful coming from it. Sometimes they, yeah. they do give me a really good laugh. Um, and I think that you know, you can't, there are some people who I see who are healthcare educators who engage on every single one and try to win the argument. There's no, there's no winning or losing. The only way to win the argument is to not have one. And so for some people, like, I'm not here to try to convince you to agree with abortion. Like I tell people that time and time again, if you don't like abortion, great, don't have one. Like I'm not here yeah. um, to make you think here's why you, that's between, you yourself. That's between, yeah, you, your right. doctor and your God. Exactly. You know. Exactly. Like you do mm -hmm. you, but, um, but you don't get to decide for other people. So um, yeah, some people are just really strange. Um, yeah. I would say the, the weirdest people I get are most likely on my YouTube and it's really, it's a lot of old men who are very inappropriate. And I'm like, and this is why the world is the way it is. Cause you think it's okay to say this to somebody, you know, and they're yeah. like, you, you're so pretty. You'd be prettier if you did X, Y, and Z. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm sorry. Do you think I care? But yeah, yeah the trolls are, the trolls make me giggle. Sometimes. They seem, yeah, they seem to, <laughs> to make you laugh more than bother you. I mean, are you ever, no. are you ever concerned for the safety of yourself or your family? I mean, abortion doctors have been killed. Yeah, no, I think that um, part of the reason I do, I am so vocal and I'm passionate about showing up to the protests, doing these things is because mm. I'm in Oregon. I'm in a state where mm. my rights are very much protected. And if I were a doctor in Texas or Ohio or elsewhere right now, I wouldn't feel as cavalier about being able to say these things, right? I yeah. can put on my abortion shirt. I can walk outside and I'm like, everybody's like, where'd you get that? You know, yeah. as opposed to other places where yeah, you yeah. might get yelled at or, you know, yeah. uh, you get targeted. That's true. But yeah, I mean, there are, again, there are lots of ways to protect yourself, lots of services that I use to, to yeah. make sure that things are there. But yeah, I think it's just part, it, it, we could stay silent and not say anything, um, but yeah, it's not going to help. It's not going to help anybody. So I will say as a patient who is, you know, I'm not looking for abortion care right now, but I care very much about having the right to that if, mm -hmm. if needed. I really feel protected by individual doctors like yourself who are vocal, as well as all of all of the major medical organizations, mm -hmm. including ACOG, ASRM, all these large AMA organizations who are standing up for our rights right now. It's it, it is heartening to see like, hey, like literally we're all on the same page here. It's a small group of people who aren't on the same page. Yeah. And it's it is encouraging to see that, um, to know that they have our backs. But I don't want to burst your bubble completely, but ACOG and the AMA have very recently donated a lot of money to anti-choice political campaigns, which trust me, we are working on calling that out. Really? And getting them to, to stop the bullshit. Yeah. 
Okay. So, interesting. So no, it's, it's great. You know, I trust yeah. me, ACOG people, if you're listening, I'm here and I love what you're doing and just know that we will hold you accountable to every last okay. penny. <laughs> where can, where why... can I learn more about that? This is, that's interesting. They, they haven't publicly said that, right? This no, is something that I you're th- finding so out I, through. I think it is. So I think if you look up the PACs, you can see that they are forced to um, to disclose who they donate to. So if you do okay. if you do a quick Google, but that is why like myself and other doctors, um, fertility specialists, we have all said, screw you. We're not relying on the big organizations to save us. We're making our own and we're making our own <laughs> 501c3s and advocacy groups. And we're not being um, you know, told that we have to abide by the rules of a pack that we can put our money where it really matters. So I am wow. glad that they are speaking up and I want them yeah. to do more, like a yeah. lot more. <laughs> yeah. Well, the Heart of Healthcare currently has a grant challenge up. Um, so if you go to heartofhealthcarepodcast.com and then go to grants, we have a $25,000 grant that we're giving away to a, an organization. So you mm. um, you guys should take a look at that. I sure am We're, we're accepting that. applications until September 10th. Oh, okay. Well, I just wrote that down on my to-do list. So you better believe it. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. We're, um, and then, yeah. So, and, and share with any other organizations working in this space because we want to be able to support the work. Absolutely. Oh, awesome. Well, (laughs) Dr. Lincoln, this has been a great conversation. Thank you for all you do. And thank you for your time today. Likewise. And thank you for giving, giving space and voice to these issues. I really appreciate it. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Heart of Healthcare. If you like the show, be sure to subscribe, leave a review on Apple Podcasts, follow us on social, and tell all your friends to listen. The Heart of Healthcare is a product of Offscript Health. We are a healthcare engagement company built for patients and caregivers by patients and caregivers. Our executive producers are Matthew Zachary and Andrew McDowell. Our senior producer is Brianna Seeley. Our host is Hallie Tecco. It is recorded, mixed, and edited by Brianna Seeley. For advertising and media inquiries, email media at offscriptnot.com. That's media at offscript.com. For more information, visit offscript.com.